You ready to get started? I'm ready. I've got my shirt right here as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering, I was like, where's the shirt? I was like, why isn't he wearing the shirt? You know what? I took them out of the frames during this lockdown. Did you? Because people was always requesting like little messages via whatever and stuff, innit? So I took all my yeah. shirts out. So when it's like birthdays and things like that, I just put on a shirt and do a video in it. Uh, how often I... do you wear it? It it still fits. It's still baggy. <laughs> That's the good thing. It fit good. How did your call up come about? My international call up came about in 1997. There was interest with the JFF um, in regards to myself and um, Robbie, my teammate at Wimbledon. Um, I think it was a QPR game. Played him in the cup. I scored. I think Robbie scored as well. So there was a bit of a talking after about would we be interested? And I was like, yeah, I'd love to sit down and talk about it for sure. Paulie, Dion, Fitzroy and a few others. They was out on like a trial, which I was a bit amazed about. Like, why are these guys on trial? They're good players, man. But they flew me out and um, they just, what do you think? I said, I want in. I want this. Never had that sort of feeling like that around football and a sort of calling for the cause as well. Um, so I was more than happy to do that. But, um, the problem I had was um, in my contract at Wimbledon, they only wanted me to play for England, mm -hmm. which was a, a tall asking. Um, I think Glenn Hodder was the manager around that time, and his scouts was always coming to our Wimbledon matches as well. Um, Ted Buxton. But I just thought, you know what, what's the chances of me getting in that England squad just for the sake of it's England, and that'll be it. Just get named in it, maybe, if I'm lucky. But once Jamaica came knocking, it was like, yeah, let's do it. But I had to wait until... February the 3rd, 1998, to make my debut against Brazil. So I was so super pleased to get that, that call up. Who, whose idea was it to put that clause in your contract? Because that delayed everything. I think we were in like yeah. a seven month delay until your debut. Yeah, yeah it did it cause a bit of anguish as well. Because I was, I, I was just looking on it. The club's kind of faced in that regard is that they're trying to deny that I've got Jamaican dad and a mum from Barb Barbados. Uh, those were my options. So I was like, no, I'm not having that. But I think what really cheesed them off is that <clears throat> I just went and got myself a Jamaican passport. You didn't and, tell uh, them? What were you telling them for? <laughs> <don't... laughs> it's my life. What, are they going to tell me when to go to the toilet next? Mm, mm, next mm. You know, once I got my passport, um, the Federation knew that, obviously, and then the, it was just a slow process that to go to FIFA to, to deem me eligible, and that took a few months until I think January or something like that, and then I was free to join up with the squad in February for the, the Gold Cup of 98. It's really strange because when you look at that squad that England took to the World Cup, it's not as if they're short of talent, so why were they trying to block your you know, opportunity to play at international level? Um, maybe they saw the progress with myself, but that was a load of rubbish because they didn't reflect that sort of projection with me with my wages at the time. Mm -hmm. So the two didn't match up. So I was like, you know what? I, there's not many opportunities you can play international football, senior football. So that's what I took on. Um, and that filled me with great pride as well. It was such a special feeling here in the National Anthem for the very first time. Um, it gave me goosebumps with the whole crowd. In um, we played this, The first game was in Miami against Brazil. And Gold it was just Cup. Goosebumps. Yeah, so the, the whole fans were involved with the, the anthem. And it just sent a shiver down my back. I was like, whoa, this game is mad. So, um, yeah, it was pleasing. It's very pleasing. Mm -hmm. How proud was your dad? Because he must have been jumping for joy to think that his son is now representing his country or both of your countries. Yeah, he was very pleased at that. I'm very proud. He's probably still talking about it till, till this day. Um, we have a frosty relationship anyway, due to football. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to read too tough into that. But yeah, he, he, he felt immense pride. Um, he came to a, a warm-up game up at West Bromwich Albion. When we mm. played them, and uh, I ended up scoring in that game, and he was in the crowd as well. I didn't know he was going to be in the crowd, but he was at the at the game in the crowd, <laughs> and I scored in a runoff into his direction. So, uh, 
yeah, that was crazy to to see him afterwards. He didn't say he was going up there. Jamaican British born players mm. placed on trial. Why was that? I don't know. I just found it a bit weird because I, I knew how good the players were anyway. Mm. Um, but maybe they had to just prove themselves. I'm not sure. Well, they weren't. I don't think they was playing Premier League at the time. I think probably Championship. But even yeah. when you look at Championship level, it's still a, a higher class level. Um, so I, I was just a bit surprised that they went for a trial. I think they, to be fair, the boys paid for their own flights to get out there. That was the heart and spirit of those boys. They paid. So they, they dipped their hand in their own pocket and, and paid for their own flights and stuff to, to go on trial to, to showcase what they've got and what a decision that was. Do you think it was like JFF's way of saying, let's test if these boys really want to play for Jamaica or are they just looking at it as a opportunity to feature a World Cup? I think it's a bit of both. Um, I don't think myself or Robbie O had to have trials. Mm. Um, whether that's down to the latest we was playing at Premier League. Um, and I think that's probably looked unfair as well. If you're looking at Premier League, surely you can look at Championship and, and put the two together and say, you know what, they, these are playing in the top two tiers of the English leagues. Um, that must carry some weight and strength as well. Um, I didn't feel awkward about it. I just thought, you know what, they've decided to fly me out there to do to come and show me around the place. And I, I just loved it. So how was your welcome when you finally were released and you were eligible to go and play for Jamaica? What was the welcome like? particularly amongst the Jamaican-born players? I think the players were... They were curious, for sure. There wasn't no frostiness or, or anything like that. I remember Peter Cargill, um, he was my roomie. He, he just... One of the first things he said, yeah, the people back on Vex with you now. I was like, <laughs> what do you mean, Vex? I said, certain things were out of my control. But that was the impression. Mm. And that was based on, obviously, what's gone on through the media, um, and it looked like I was just waiting and all that. I didn't get no backup from the Federation at all with this. I was just left hang out to dry to deal with this on my own. So whether that had an impact on my sort of integration with the squad, um, I didn't feel anything to, with the players or anything. In my first training session, I thought there was going to be fights because of the language that was used, certain phrases that we can't repeat on here. But um, for me, it was just show them how good I am technically. And show them that I'm up for this. So that's what I went and done in the first training session is to let them know, yes, <laughs> I'm here. This is what I'm about. Um, and gain respect like that. Why did it take so long for JFF to approach you in the first place? Because it seems to me that obviously that happened almost three decades ago and we're still mm. you know, continuing that same process where we're waiting like forever to approach a player that does have, you know, great qualities. Why does that happen? Um, not sure. Um, it's a bit disappointing because there's so much talent and a big pool of players that can represent the nation. Um, it's like we fail to sort of really capitalise on, on, on making it an open process for players to come and represent the nation. Um, there's good players in it now, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But we've missed out on quite a few good players that um, could have represented the country. So what needs to happen is it's a tough one. It's a tough one. Uh, I think a lot of players are sort of hesitant in, with the setup. I'm not sure why there's a hesitancy in not bringing or inquiring about the English base Jamaicans that are here. Um, not too sure why. Whether it's a, I don't, I don't know. It could be political for, for all I know, but um, missing out big time because there's players here or coaches here that can definitely help improve the general game of Jamaica out there. We're seeing, we're seeing, you know, little coaches out in in Jamaica now. White coaches like Wally Downs getting mm -hmm. a. Cap I'm like, come on, I was. Yep. We've got better people capable of doing greater things than that instead of what we're seeing is like people that's got money can come in do what they want but is that the right thing for the nation i don't think so um but there's there's hungry people there there's good coaches that could go over there 
and can represent the nation in, in, in that regard and, and bring bring forth with them all their sort of talents, their connections, um, encourage more players to go for it because that was one of my remits when I had that interaction with Jamaica, I was like, I was telling players back at Wimbledon, a um, player called Patrick Adjiman, and I was telling them, I said, you play for under 20, in, in an under 21, that could be just it, under 21s and no further. But I goes, you play for your home nation, your family's nation, I said, you'll be a king forever. I said, they will lift you up on high. Because I felt that with my personal experience is that once you play for your home nation, you can't beat that. When you hear the national anthem, when you're thinking of your family and your friends and all that, it connects you to a point of you can't you can't stop this. So players need to be encouraged to, to represent their, their home nation or their parental nation as much as possible. Because I think that's, especially in, in this day and age, we see now the world is operating. Um, there's a lack of sort of respect for, for, for black players out there in terms of what they achieve compared to the white counterparts. Mm -hmm. There's no sort of level playing field as such. So, you know what? Live a life according to your own will, but fulfill it. Look, where can you fulfill it? You know, I was blessed to have the two years with the reggae boys and that will always live with me. Those experiences, the memories, the friendships, mm -hmm. the, the laughter, the jokes, the food, everything, that could never go. Mm -hmm. And if the federation needed help trying to find out over here who can qualify for the for the national side, I would love to help mm -hmm. and keep my ears and eyes about so I can help the country again. So because um, the talent is there, no doubt. Everyone goes to Jamaica for certain things. There, there's so much potency out there, you can't deny it. But it's, I just think it's you know the the hierarchy that's here in this country. Um, you're probably under more pressure with your clubs if you do go. I remember my, after my debut with Jamaica, I got back to Wimbledon and they all thought, oh, how was your holiday? Because they just associate Jamaica with holiday, you know. Sun so I said, yeah. Yeah. So they, they was like, I was like, yeah, the holiday was all right. You know, debut against Romario and Edmundo and then Nielsen on the left wing doing all this step of, yeah, yeah. I said, yeah, I didn't hear anything after that. Not one word after that, but it's breaking down those barriers still. Um, and we can do that, no problem. But we've got to grow what's within, expand what's within. You know, there's other there's other coaches out there as well. There's people that can come in and help, no doubt. So and that's no slant on Theodore Whitmore anyway. That's you know, there's people out there that can help his cause, the nation's cause, because this is bigger than any one person. No, I think you're absolutely right about that. I think someone like Paul Hall will be a excellent addition to the coaching setup of the reggae boys. I'm actually quite surprised that they haven't approached him yet. Um, I don't know the reason for that. So like, mm. maybe you could shed some light on that for me. Well, I don't know why they haven't. I don't think there's any sort of hesitancy from Hawley to do that. But it's all in timing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Timing mm -hmm. might be not right for Paul. Maybe not time for the JFF. But again, you've got Bibi Gardner, he's taken badges. He's a good asset as well. He's got so much knowledge from when he came to England to, to play his trade after a brilliant World Cup at 19 years old. Um, so he would have taken back a lot of knowledge, a lot of professionalism. Um, and that was always labelled at the Federation, even when I was playing, about the lack of professionalism around the place. And I, and I, and I could see that from way back as well. You know, we, we do things in our own style, which is totally fine. Um, but there's some some certain things that would need to tinker with, for instance, the, the leagues um, to get that right up to standards. You know what I mean, the surfaces and everything, standards of coaches. Um, but all of this, everyone knows what needs to happen. It's just pushing the button to do it. Now, what were some of the things that you know completely blew you away in terms of lacking in professionalism when you linked up with the boys I think really blew you away it's just little things I remember the night before the first game against Croatia in the World Cup we still didn't even know what we was getting paid nothing like that we were still in discussions the night before and in my head I'm like we should have been this should have been settled long ago the night before the game, you're supposed to be just relaxing. 
focusing on your 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 involvement in the team, the squad, and just channeling all your energy in, into that instead of sitting around the table discussing money and all this rubbish. Money in the end of the day was irrelevant. So um, for me, it was just like no one can take away your World Cup appearances. I know I only had one, but I could live off that one. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was a winning game as well. Um, <laughs> You know, we shouldn't be discussing things like that. The no, because that, that the then has an effect on you when you go into the game, doesn't it? Yeah, and everyone wants to do well. Everyone wants to do well. Um, the, the, the shape changed as well as we got out there. Um, as you know, traditionally, 3-5-2. We get there, it's 4-4-2. Four, four, I've got my hunches why it changed and who instigated all of that to a point. Um but we got where we wanted to get to in that last game because I think by then the embarrassment had set in deep and we just said, look, we don't want to come here to be embarrassed fully. Um, and if we are going to lose, we're going to lose on our own strength. We need our own shape back, 3-5-2. And that's what we did. And we achieved that that, that win against Japan. Um, but these are the things that needs tightening up. I'm sure it's a lot better now, but these, these are some of the, the problems we had back in the 98 World Cup squad. I think those these problems still exist till this day. I know most certainly does they exist amongst the reggae girls because um, the mm -hmm. issues that you're speaking of these are the issues that the girls unfortunately went through whilst they were coincidentally at their World Cup appearance as well. Do the JFF have anyone that holds them accountable for their lack of? Action? I don't know. I don't know, but that's everything starts from the head. A fish rots from the head. Yeah. And that's where all the problems will lie. The head is not fully transparent and open with what it's doing. You're going to see the cracks of it further down the chain of things. So, as I said, it's not a crit criticism on the federation, but it's a, it's a highlighting. Look, if we got the if we got the nation's heart heart's interest at the forefront of our minds, we will do what we need to do to get the best achieved results. Um, I saw that World Cup. I was pretty quiet back then. I just, I just want to be in this World Cup. I was desperate to play, um, desperate to be part of all of this. But you can see there's a there's one or two individuals around that that use the fame of the Reggae Boys for their own personal gain. I think I know who you're talking about. I ain't calling no names. I call out the names when I'm ready. I, I, I think I know there's who you're talking about because that bounced on that team. Because I, I, look, I look through that list and I can see that the English born players, certain players showed up to represent Jamaica after the World Cup. And I can only notice one player who didn't show up. <laughs> Why, what, who's that then? Why? Who? I mean, if you're not gonna name no name, I'm not gonna name no name neither because I could be wrong. I ain't saying nothing. But I think this individual might be in the States. I could be wrong. <laughs> Put it this way, they're on the planet. They're on the planet. I knew from early. I knew from early. Mm. I knew. Do you People think, were... did that create any friction within the squad? Like, honestly speaking, because like you said, you know, that player was posted almost like, the important player like you know we need him if we want to do well we need to have him in the squad so like did that pose any sort of friction in the team no because when it came down to keeping up that ball and doing what you can do with the ball we knew that that person was nowhere near the most technically gifted on the ball when the ball's bouncing we know who, who you can rely on you can't fool everybody the media, you guys got fooled. All the press, the lot, we all got fooled. Because after that, that tournament, when it all came out, we could see as clear as day what's going on and who was profiting and who was doing, nah, that's not right. That ain't right. So I take it you guys didn't get any money from that book that came out then, did you? I don't know. I don't know money from no book. I don't know money from no book. 
Did, book. did you guys know about book. the book? Did you know that the book was, you know, in process of being written or did you just see it when it... Yeah, we saw it. We saw that every day in camp. So the book was being written in camp? Mm -hmm. How did you guys feel about that? Because that sounds a bit like, you know, unusual to me. I don't know of any player who has gone to a World Cup, their first World Cup at that, and within such a iconic moment, you're busy writing a book. Like that to me just seems like you're here to capture. All I'm gonna say, when that first goal went in, I had a bittersweet moment all in the same moment. It's mad, isn't it? Yes. It was a bittersweet. Because all I know was that week leading up to that game, I was in the team. And then all of a sudden it just changed, like the last day or so. I was like, hmm. I'm not one to go and question the manager. Mm -hmm. I'm one of them like to keep myself quiet, humble, work hard, get to where I need to get to. Played 700 matches like that. Didn't have to beg no manager or coach to put me in no team. Didn't have to be his friend. Didn't have to sit on his table. Didn't have to go and get him an apple or a paper to get in the team. Let the football do the talking. I didn't have to be no friend of no coach. But I somehow played 700 matches. Why? Because I applied myself properly. Mm -hmm. Talk to the manager to make that right. That's his job. My job is to put in his mind, I'm the one for that spot. But unfortunately, I was, I was just so sort of, I felt let down. I knew something was going on, but it's just hard to prove. Um, I, was, I was disappointed with not being in the starting lineup. Why do you think you weren't in that lineup? I just think someone with. Uh, Another team that was in the, in the manager's ear, um, and, w and the way we went to to that shape of four four two would only really benefit one person from that position. It didn't benefit the ten other players out there because they was all in different areas of the pitch, without the right support around them. So when you got Pepe Goodison, left side centre back, he's got. If you guard a left back in this game, he's got one other defender next to him. They play as a three. Mm. They play as a three. We normally have the man advantage in midfield. We didn't have it that day. Didn't have it that day. And that's what disrupted it. It was to me, it was selfish. And the and the coach got hoodwinked into that. Because I, <laughs> I remember the first meetup after that World Cup, he went ballistic. He was fuming, mm. the coach because he knew he got hoodwinked on the pitch and off the pitch and in the media because he bigged up this player as if it was his most important. And I was like, wow, it's like you bigged up the Trojan horse coming to mash up things. But <laughs> the years have gone by, I still can't get over that. I'm just like, not just me personally, but the effect that squad had. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, the strong feeling was after we lost 5 0 to Argentina, I was ready to pack my bag and go. And my bag was packed. But I was going home. I just mm -hmm. didn't have my passport on me. <laughs> I was like, I didn't come all the way. I know it's only down the road in, in France, but I was ready to go home. Everyone else partied that night. I was vexed. I stayed in the hotel. There's only a couple of us that stayed back. I was vexed. I wanted to go home. Mm. Then I sat there and I sat there with a couple of them, just had a little reasoning and all that, a deep conversation, you know what I mean? We had a good reasoning talk with a few of the boys. And then we had a meeting about the last game. And they all said, look, we're playing 3 5 2. Let's get back to that. And that's what we did. You know, that's quite interesting because listening to you talk about that moment, you know, stuff that happened behind your back, mm -hmm. stuff that happened with the team overall. It seems to me as that moment, you know, deciding to make that player as almost in some sense, the poster boy for the reggae boys, that could be the reason why a lot of people are like, you know, have some resentment when you look to bring English born players into the team. Cause they're probably gonna think is the same thing going to happen again? Yeah, that could that could be the thought process as well, which would it would be a shame if it lasted so long, because time should have changed that as well. Action should have changed that as well. But all it takes is one time for it to happen, and it can set people back decades. But um, other than that, the whole experience was a brilliant one. 
Um, I'm sure every player in the squad and around it would have said the same thing, just to be around it and, and experience what we did. It was, it was beautiful. Um, love to do it again. I, I would love to step back in time and do it all again. Every what would single you do day. differently? What would I do differently? Good question, you know. I was a quiet cat anyway. I was just... Mm -hmm. I expressed myself with my body. <laughs> um, I'm more talky now, but back then I was just like, you know what? Play. Would I want to be more vocal? Yeah. Would I like to get up my show a bit more? Yeah. I'm a sensitive old soul. That's, that's <laughs> me. And I care about myself. I care about what people think. You know what I mean? Um, would I, if I was more ruthless in, in a few things that I was doing, you know what I mean, in my personality, just be more ruthless. But again, that's not me. Mm -hmm. That's not in my yeah. spirit. At the time, if I need to be ruthless, I'm ruthless. But if I don't need to be, I can't put myself into that position of I've got, I've got to annihilate for the sake of it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like a lion. A lion don't go roaring around the jungle all day long, badding up himself. I'm a lion. <laughs> they want to a lion. You mess with that at the wrong time, you're finished. That's how yeah. I like approach myself. I don't want to go around barking. I, I was at a club like that. We had players like that, characters like that. You know, screaming what they're going to do next. And I'm like, it's not me. If it happened, it happened. Just make, make sure you know it was me that make it happen. Mm -hmm. but, no, there's not much I would change in it. Not much at all. I'll just I'll keep it more or less the same. Maybe challenge the, the coach, but again, that's not me. That's not me. I respected the coach on his on all his decisions. And I felt he respected me as well because after that, I think it was in 99, he made me the, the captain. Um, because he could see my sort of calming effect, my, my sort of quiet effect on the players. You know, he saw that I was a spiritual person at that time as well. I was going to church at that time. And then he would ask me to say the, the you know, Psalm 23, Lord is my shepherd. So that was down to me, um, reciting that, giving us some good wishes before we stepped out onto the pitch. Um, so I was very proud that he, he saw there was some leadership qualities within me um, to name me captain for the year. Um, and that was, that was, that was a big sort of boost for my sort of confidence with him um, because of that. Do you think that you ever would have worn that captain's armband had you been capped by England? No chance. You're not going to get capped by England and wear the armbands. Nah. But Jamaica missed out on good players. One, mm -hmm. for example, Andrew Impey. Mm -hmm. Now he played, I think, 45 minutes for England under 21, and that made him ineligible to represent Jamaica. Was that in a competitive match? Yeah. Just 45 minutes. Yeah. Once he knew I was playing, he's like, Gailey, have a word with them. He said, I'm going to talk to them. Oh, and I did. The next meetup, yeah. I said, look, Imps, he's desperate to play. And then they came back to me with the feedback. He's played 45 minutes for the 21s in, of England. So that ruled him out. He would have been perfect in that squad. Um, the one regret I do, not it's out of my control anyway, and out of everyone's control, was that I wish that squad had played England at the time. Yeah. Oh, that could have happened back in that, 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 that year, 1998, or around it. I would have loved to have faced England with our group of players against their group of players, just to look on their face. I would have been looking down the line when the Jamaican National Anthem was playing. I want to have a look at Saul Campbell's like, hearing this song. <laughs> Yo, you're hearing this. <laughs> That's what I wanted to do. John Barnes opted to play for England. And then you've got players like mm. Sterling, Jamaican-born players, opting to play for England. So, you know, why does that mm. happen? I think it's economics. Mm -hmm. I honestly do. Um, can you imagine an English football club paying Raheem an obscene amount of money like he's getting today and he's Jamaican? Uh, hell no. <laughs> It's not, it's not in their best interest to, to enrich us economically yeah. or, or within our stature. Yeah. So 
that's what I think it's down to. It's, it's definitely economics. Um, if you want the big dough, this is what you've got to do. And I'm not saying they're towing line, but in a way they are economically. Because, as I said, Jamaica's got a hell of a lot of talent. It always will have. Um, and it's a shame that the players feel obligated to the, the paymasters to, like, you know, do their bidding for them. At the same time, it's the demise of your home nation. Imagine Raheem playing for Jamaica right now. Where would Jamaica in, be with just Raheem in the squad? Incredible. Because you're not going to have him. He's going to be pulling some backup as well. Mm-hmm. He's going to be pulling boys. You know, say, like, listen, come, come. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he will still get his pay that he's getting currently. Yeah, because his football is doing the talking for him, isn't it? Yeah. So it's just like you just have to pay him. Otherwise, he's not going to pay play in your league. But you see other nations with, with international players that play here. They're, they're, they're a small nation, but they will still pay those boys the top dollars. You've got someone mm. like Wilfred Zaha, born in Ivory Coast, and he opts to play for Ivory Coast. And I see yeah. all these young African players, and I'm really proud of them. But in a yeah, yeah. way, I'm just like, oh, man, I wish our players could do that. Like, with no yeah. hesitation, just, like, play for your country. Because when... When it goes wrong, when it goes south, we're going to back you. We're always going to give you that sense of belonging, you know. And then when you play, when you when you go the other direction and something mm. happens to you in the league and then the media comes at you, then where where do you go from there? It's a hard place to come back from, especially in, with this media. You're demonised from before you can get out your nappy. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Um, it's unfair uncalled for i understand the system that we we live in and and these are just the 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 symptoms of the system that is oppressing people psychologically physically mentally i think um and even within the game so that's what i do in my own spare time understand the system that we're currently operating it weren't built for us it definitely weren't built to serve us anyway and i just think players in particular, they just want to have a, they just want to play football. We're seeing great steps. You look at Raheem and Marcus Rashford in the media here now, they're pulling up trees. They're, they're challenging authorities, they're challenging the government um, while they're still playing and doing very well still playing. You can't tell them, oh, just shut up and get on with your football. Well, they're doing that. They're still scoring goals <laughs> and they're doing great works off the pitch as well. You would like to think they, they've got that influence within the game, with the younger players to, to lead them in a, in a different direction. But I can understand the pull of the stature of England, um, the economics that it wields, but at what price? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, this shirt is gold, man. <laughs> Literally. Look, that can't leave me ever. That can't leave. I've got an England youth cap. That's somewhere in storage. Just look. <laughs> That's in storage. This, that ain't far from me when I sleep. <laughs> that ain't far. You know what I mean? You can't buy that. You mm. cannot buy that. Jamaica obviously gave you a sense of belonging then, didn't it? Yeah, it's, it's weird because, as I said, my experience was I felt a bit like hung out to dry by the media. Well, not by the media, but through the Federation. They didn't really defend me with my sort of inclusion in the squad with all the stories I just waited and all this and he didn't want to come no one asked me that no one put that towards me that was just other people talking um, but we got there in the end I wish that was different um, but you know time's gone on now what more can you say about it um, all I can take take away is a lot of positives from that squad Beautiful time, beautiful people, so much jokes. When I talk to Hawley on a weekly basis, we're, we're laughing at our times back then more than we've, we've played here. You know what I mean? That's how strong it is because it meant so much to us. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I wish we could all get together as a squad and and, and, and just gather up. Who are you inviting? We need to do it. Everybody. Are you sure about everybody that? Around. Yeah. Even him. Even him. Tell him about himself. Oh, 
Oh, he couldn't fool. He, he knew he couldn't fool me, and he couldn't fool the players because the, the players put him through a couple of little things, and they sussed him out with one of them. <laughs> so that was it. That was it. His goose was cooked. You think he would show up if you say gave him an invite? Hmm. No. No. I don't think so. Wow. Okay then. What was your highlight of your international career? Uh, debut. Uh, I can't go much further than debut. The first goal was against El Salvador in Los Angeles. Um, playing in the World Cup with the squad, even though I was a bit topsy turvy that like I wanted to go on, but I played the game. I'm very proud of that. Proud of the team's performance and everybody involved. Um, just hearing the national anthem at a national stadium. I think that's the one. Leading the, the, the team out in the national stadium. Hearing that anthem, man. <laughs> and the music in the background as well. I, I tell people that now, and they're like, what? You guys had music? Like, yeah, we had music in the background. That was setting the tempo. So that just gave it atmosphere and all that. And it empowered us as well to like, just keep in your rhythm, keep in, into your flow and perform. Which moment have you savoured most in your career? Scoring that goal against Manchester United to knock them out of the FA Cup when they were the then cup holders or captain in Jamaica? Favourite goal, I would say, when I scored against Chelsea. Yeah. Beat them 4-2. Um, that one sticks with me because, one, I was allowed to drive to, to Stamford Bridge, um, which you wouldn't get players doing now. So I parked up around the corner. Um, we was already wound up with the, the newspaper articles by Frank LaBeouf, who was running up his mouth about our team and all this and all that. So that's why he got damaged in that game as he did. Um, his ego got bruised and I say good. Um, his team lost 4-2 and I say good. <laughs> um, and then walking home, walking towards my car after the game, I was bricking it because I saw a mob of Chelsea fans coming towards me and I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> that bittersweet moment, isn't it? He's <laughs> scoring the goal, but the bit in his like, might get a beat in here. <laughs> and then the big guy in, in the group, like, wait, get on. Like, yeah. Like, Good goal today, son. Good goal. Be oh. could be like that. But, what? <laughs> Chess was up, man. Like, yeah, man. It's like, step to the car now. <laughs> um, so I felt 10 feet tall after that. But, uh, but yeah, playing and captain in Jamaica coming out. The national stadium with the armband on. That was a special moment. Having that that sense of responsibility that the the head coach has given you, yeah, that lives with me and, and stays high up in my sort of rankings of positive effects. 